five by 15 because I'm always so um, influenced by what's come before. And um, yeah, Jack, I'm just thinking now, I'm gonna talk about the earth. I'm not gonna be able to get some of your very resonant um, ideas out of my head. And I think, you know, a paradise that's inclusive to a point really, um, really is saying something about um, the biosphere as well at this point in time, um, maybe not as much of a paradise as it once was. Um, so as Rosie said, I elected to write a quiz book um, and I should probably explain why I did that because it, it might seem a bit odd, um, especially as my other work, I previously focused on very specific supply chains uh, like fashion and textiles, as Rosie mentioned, and also plastic. Sadly, those two things have kind of converged recently, which maybe I'll come back to. Um, so I wanted something that had some joy in it because I think when we talk about our response to the nature and climate emergency, um, the dual crisis that we face, the existential crisis, you know, for obvious reasons, um, it's, there's, there's not that many laughs in it. Um, it's also hard for people to drop in to this subject um, when they were told, we were all told to an extent that um, it either wasn't for us, we didn't have to worry about it, it was being overblown, it, would, um, it was a distraction, you know, all of these things up until the present day, you know, anti-growth coalition, et cetera, et cetera. So I never blame anyone for not being an early adopter of sustainability. Um, and for many years, I suppose, what I was trying to do was write about something that a lot of people were not that interested in, which um, meant knocking on a lot of doors and trying to convince commissioning editors in TV and in print and then online that this was something that was worthy that we could make a story out of this because it is actually the biggest story of uh, of our generations and it is also the most interesting as I will now try and attempt to explain so I decided to do a quiz book and um, there's the cover and I wanted to um, really talk about our lives and how we live our lives. And, you know, I know that there is a massive debate between, in the environmental movement, between system change or individual change. And quite often individual change is dismissed as something as, you know, it's obviously not gonna do the numbers. It's a distraction, it's a delay tool. I don't really believe that. I think that individual change is really important, even as a gateway to understanding why we need system change. I think we need both. Um, I don't think there is um, an equivalence between how important they are, but I think it's really important to meet people where they are. And as I sort of explained before, a lot of us had fairly sporadic um, or non-existent environmental education. I was personally very lucky because I went to a lot of schools. I went to 15 schools in the UK and Ireland. And I just happened to start my senior school when they were doing a bit of, ex of an experiment and they had an environmental science teacher. And I did environmental science for two years um, at senior school. But I realize now that that was a little bit of an anomaly and I loved it, it was so amazing. We used to learn about polar bears and Inuit people and uh, the tundra and, you know, I, it just really fired up my imagination. But increasingly I'm talking to people who are now expected to know about sustainability, either through their kids who are coming back with lots of questions and lots of diktats quite often, and also at work. So some people's jobs are now um, being um, increased um, so that they also have to cover, even if it's something like recycling. And what a lot of people feel, and I really have sympathy with this, they don't know how they're going to catch up. It's like you've missed a whole period of school and you're too embarrassed to ask the questions. So in a nutshell, that is why I wanted to um, do this book in this way and I'm going to very quickly run through some of the chapters and because the nature when you write a quiz is that you can't stop thinking of quiz questions I will probably fire out some questions as well don't answer I mean you can shout them out on your own at home that's fine but don't we, there's no mechanism for answering these right now it's just personal kudos um, is your is your prize um, so they're not necessarily ones from the book either because I don't want to spoil the book for you. Um, so um, I wanted to keep it very simple because actually this is quite simple. 
No, it's not. It's extremely complex because Earth system dynamics are complex. But on one level, our role and our response is quite simple. What could we do? And the answer is that we could be a much better mate to the planet because we understand, you know, humans are by and large quite good at being friends. They're quite good at building rapports, even if it sometimes that's manipulative and you just want something. Um, once you realize where your bread is buttered, as it were, once you realize that you need to maintain these relationships, then we're quite good at doing that. And some people do it for completely altruistic reasons too. So the planet is ours, you know, it's our home. Uh, nature is not separate from us. We are part of nature. We are just another species, which I think, you know, it, it's a good idea to remind ourselves now and again, that we're not the only species, far from it. And I think, once you sort of allow yourself to remember how dependent you are on planet Earth, then it becomes a very easy conceit. Just be a better friend. Just And what does that mean? It means prioritizing the Earth in the things that you do and say and the services and products that you buy. You know, everything becomes invaded, if you like, or infested with this idea of prioritizing the Earth a little bit more than you do, because at the moment we're pretty bad friend to the earth um you know numerous times a day so really if we can just reduce that down and be a better friend then we will have a much better um balance um so it starts with planet hype and i really think that we should hype up the planet more because it is kind of incredible and we are part of it and it's our home and we should be really proud of it um we also there's a lot of bad news for obvious reasons but we also know a lot more about the planet um, than we have ever done at any point in history. So earth science has come on by leaps and bounds in the last 30 years, and that's really, really exciting. So it's a good time to sort of chip in, even if it's the first time. Um, for example, here's a little question. So there's a caption that accompanies a picture of planet Earth, and the picture is from NASA. It's a view of the Earth as seen by the Apollo 17 crew traveling towards the moon. This translunar coast photograph extends from the Mediterranean Sea area to the Antarctic South Polar Ice Cap. It's the first time the Apollo trajectory made it possible to photograph the South Polar Ice Cap. Notes the heavy cloud cover in the Southern Hemisphere. Almost the entire coastline of Africa is clearly visible. So this is a caption that accompanies a very beautiful picture that you will have seen. But what two word phrase is this picture usually known by? The answer is blue marble, because it looks like a marble and it's mainly blue. We'll come back to that in a minute because the ocean is often very undervalued, but that's kind of incredible. So we've all grown up knowing that picture but that picture wasn't available to previous generations we now know so much about the earth how it works how the system works how the biosphere works and how the ecosystem works so just on the biosphere again coming back to the complexity versus simplicity the thing with the biosphere is it's not really that big when you think about it so i think it's about 12 miles in its entirety and that's from the deepest depths of the ocean to the highest point of the atmosphere that we know about. But really, uh, life, most life exists in a smaller part of that. So seven miles maximum, really. And we know these boundaries because we have things like submersibles now. So being able to go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and we've been able to see what life is there. And unfortunately, what we found there was a plastic bag. You may have seen those images. So we know we're polluting as well. That's the bad news. But we also know, like, we can estimate the top of the biosphere. And how do we do that? By the highest flying bird. Uh, that's how we base that, what we base that assumption. So that's seven miles. That shouldn't be beyond the wit of human intelligence to stabilize those seven miles. And we do need to stabilize them, don't we? Because this is another favorite question of mine. Conditions on planet Earth over the last 10,000 to 12,000 years are represented by a Greek word to describe this period, the Holocene. But due to environmental pressures caused by humans, by us, conditions have now changed and many scientists now think we've entered a different epoch. What is this epoch called? So what replaces the Holocene? Da, da, da. The answer is the Anthropocene. 
And Anthropocene, obviously anthro, and that means of humans, we have become a geological force in our own right because we've exerted so much pressure on the planetary boundaries. That, so that means taking resources at a too fast a rate to be replenished and causing the sixth great mass extinction. So 2021, we lost more animals efficiently, more species, I should say. We lost 23 species. So these are species from mussels to plants, which have, you know, um, haven't been seen since the 1980s. So at that point, we have to write them off. And this is obviously a really, really big pressure. And um, that's why I called my chapter, Don't Be Mean to the Holocene. So if we can focus our efforts on trying to get back to the Holocene, trying to recreate those, um, those stable conditions, and obviously a lot of that relates to climate change. And that's why we have um, the Global Climate Agreement and regime through the Paris Climate Agreement. And you hear lots of mention of 1.5 degrees. Um, looks like we're going to pass that. That's the spoiler. But every degree counts because we need to try and stabilize those global temperatures. So you see, this is all, it's not just um, a load of kind of mad, crazy sort of um, things that we've decided that everyone has to do. It's all directly related to how we know that the earth systems work, which is why I really wanted to do this book. But it's cultural as well. And what we have to try and do is embed this thinking. So quite often throughout my career, I have talked about um, sustainable living, ethical living, and these lifestyle changes that you make. Now, obviously, in and of themselves, they are not going to be able to stabilize the climate, like your next door neighbor buying an electric vehicle is not going to help that much, although they might feel much better about it. However, those collective actions are really important. And what's important about those is we understand why we are doing them. Um, because we have to start joining the dots between creating a different society, a different way of living. You often call it, uh, here it referred to as the green transition. So a transition away essentially from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, which underpins um, everything that we do. And once you take your foot off the gas, metaphorically and literally, other technologies and solutions start to become possible. And that's when we can see this great acceleration away from this wasteful, polluting existence that's actually driving us towards destruction and not of the planet. The planet will be fine. So don't talk about saving the earth. We've got to talk about saving ourselves. And that's what the mission is at this point. And it can seem really trivial to then go and start obsessing about things that you do in your own life but I'm never scared of the trivial so here's a little sort of um a little starter for 10 what is this what is this implement I'll tell you what it is it's called the body flick and it came out around 2002 2003 it was manufactured by a woman who lived in the midlands um, and unfortunately they don't sell them anymore i think i've got one of the last ones but it is in, in the design museum in paris now this is the body flick and it flicks off water so when you're in the shower you dry yourself with this body flick first and then you don't have to use so many towels. Your towels will stay in circulation, which means you can reduce your energy consumption. And by the way, to wash, to launder and dry a towel costs a pound each time you do it. It's a very expensive process. And we are now living our lives as if we lived in a spa. So we wash and we launder and we want all of this kind of luxury. And these are the kind of pressures that we put on ourselves. And then that is uh, manifest in our energy bill and so on and so on and so on and so on. So some of the book, I talk about these kind of um, shifts away from a society which is a about overproduction to overconsumption to something that brings us back within the planetary boundaries. So I'm just trying to link everything that we do and all our sustainable advice that we dispense with how the ecosystem actually works. And at the end of the day, all that means is that you are being a better friend to the planet. And if you wanna take that, if you're competitive, you want to become the ultimate friend of the earth. And there we are.